John Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is one of a series on William Shakespeare's play, Othello, the Moor of Venice. And I'm going to say something about the concept of metadrama and the function of Iago as a surrogate dramatist in the play. There's a kind of criticism that's been very common, which is to treat Shakespeare's characters as, as if they are real people and to examine their motives and their actions and their flaws and their, um, their heroism and their triumphs as though we're talking about real people as models from whom we might learn how to live our lives better. And that's the, probably has been the dominant strand of Shakespeare criticism over these hundreds of years. But another way of looking at the plays is to examine them in the context of larger philosophical concepts or issues. And one of those that has become kind of interesting in the 20th century is the idea of metadrama. The term meta being the Greek term, the Greek prefix indicating something that's above uh, and looking over the object to be studied or to be discussed or analyzed. So the metadrama is something that comes up interestingly in Othello, and it's one of the ways to analyze the play and, and to make meaning from this play. Metadrama is then a critical term that became fashionable in the latter part of the 20th century in literary criticism, and it refers to aspects of a play that call attention to its status as a work of art itself, and aspects of the work that may invite reflection on the technical problems of communication and perception, or concerns about ethical issues of making literature, of making plays, of communicating, of interpreting, and of attempting to influence audiences with drama. And I'm going to describe some of the, the techniques that playwrights use, actors and directors use, that are metadramatic. One of the most common ones is breaking the fourth wall. If you go to a stage play, you're sitting in the audience, it's often dark in the audience and the stage is lit and it feels as though you're a voyeur. It feels as though you're looking at people acting out their lives, however much a pretense it is, and you're not seen. You're the unseen observer. Now, historically, by the way, this construction of the proscenium arch stage, that's the term used for it, in which you have a, a lit stage and a dark audience, and there's a clear boundary separating the audience from the action on stage. Historically, that dates from, in England at least, from around 1660, from the restoration of Charles II as monarch. It's a new kind of theater at that time, and this kind of stage wasn't used by Shakespeare and his contemporaries. They used what's called an apron stage, a stage uh, in which there might be candles lighting the stage, but the plays were performed in daytime, at least at the Globe and the other public theaters where Shakespeare's plays were performed. And the stage juts out into the audience. So you would have an audience on three sides of the actors. So the illusion that the audience is completely separate from the actors is broken down. But a metadramatic feature of more modern plays then, and more modern productions, is when an actor breaks the convention of the fourth wall and simply speaks to the audience directly instead of speaking to the other characters. And often, the other characters may be standing still, pretending that they don't hear what's going on here. And you'll see this in contemporary movies. It's become quite fashionable since the 1980s. And you can probably remember some movies where this is done to good comic effect. Can anyone recall a movie where this is done? Which one? OK, I'll have to watch that one. A very famous one from the 1980s was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And it's often used to comic effect. But breaking the fourth wall has this metadramatic effect 
because it calls into question implicitly the audience's removal and objectivity, this illusion of objectivity that the audience has, the theater audience has, in watching something that's going on as though we are kind of scientific observers watching these uh, characters uh, act on stage. It suggests that the audience is in on something with the protagonist, with the person who's speaking to the audience, in on something and sharing secrets that the other actors are not privy to. So another one that I just mentioned is the soliloquy. This simply means talking to oneself. And Hamlet has several famous soliloquies, and sometimes it's presented as thinking out loud or the unspoken thoughts of the character. And other times, the soliloquy might be as in Deadpool, I presume, and in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, speaking directly to the audience. Another metadramatic technique is to have one character who is dominating the action of the other characters. This character is sometimes called the surrogate dramatist. So this character, in effect, is acting as a playwright and as a director on his own terms. He's kind of like a, a rogue director, you might say. And this surrogate dramatist technique can invite comparison between the work of the director or the work of directing and playwriting in general as opposed to or in contrast to the success or the failure of the character on stage who's acting as a director of action in his own little plays. And I want to point out to you many times where precisely Iago is doing that throughout Othello. Another aspect of the surrogate dramatist's action is that the, the surrogate dramatist may direct a sort of a play within the play. So in Hamlet, Hamlet stages a play within the play presents this to his uncle slash stepfather. He wants to spook his uncle into admitting that he actually murdered his real father. And he thinks if he presents a play on stage in which a brother kills his brother, that Claudius, his, uh, his uncle slash stepfather, will be so alarmed that by his body language and his reactions, he will reveal his guilt. And with setting up a scene in a play within the play. So that's a common metadramatic feature because it invites reflection on the act of and the business of making plays, making literature. Another metadramatic technique is the surveillance scene in which the surrogate dramatist or the protagonist may manipulate a character or characters into a position of being spied upon or may manipulate a character into spying upon other characters. In the 20th century, the classic films of Alfred Hitchcock, such as Rear Window and Psycho, have explored the surveillance scene as a way to suggest how in classic narrative cinema, we as viewers are always positioned somehow as complicit, viewing the actions of other people who don't know they're being watched. And that, for example, there is something inherently immoral or unseemly about the pleasure we may get from watching a classic Hollywood narrative film. In Psycho, Hitchcock sets up the movie audience so that we'll feel complicit with Norman Bates as he peeps through the wall to watch the woman taking a shower. The whole point is to make the viewing audience feel vaguely uncomfortable. We shouldn't be doing this. There's a landmark essay in feminist film criticism by Laura Mulvey called Visual Pleasures in Narrative Cinema that explores this phenomenon. Laura Mulvey suggests that this phenomenon of voyeurism is a key effect of traditional Hollywood cinema. Well, as I said, traditional criticism and scholarship instead focused on the humanistic aspects, the characters as though they are real people and analyzing their motives and actions. And they use the plays as a framework for evaluating standards of responsible social conduct. Shakespeare's characters were treated as rational, autonomous individuals who should be in control of their own destinies. And treating the character as a human agent, 
as an individual agent is actually quite consistent with the dominant philosophical paradigm of modernity, of high modernity, one that I spoke about in, in one of those uh, other uh, webcasts about philosophical paradigms and knowledge production, context of knowledge production in modernity, and that's Cartesian rational individualism, the argument by René Descartes for affirming reality in which he says, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And it's my thinking that affirms the fact that I am an individual, I'm an agent, I'm in control of my destiny. And that was, in a way, an implicit break from a way of thinking about what it means to be human that might be called Platonic theism, Platonic idealism, in which it's assumed that God has created us, God gave us a soul, and that's what makes us human. And we may not be quite in control of our own actions. There may be some fates or some deities that are pulling the strings. Not so for Descartes, and not so for modernity. In the early 20th century, some philosophers began to be vexed by the question of whether we can really trust what we are seeing, what we are hearing, what we are taking in through our sensory perceptions. And this actually goes back at least to um, Immanuel Kant, the 18th century German philosopher, and the idea of das Ding an sich, he called it, the thing in itself. The argument is that as a human, we can only know reality, physical reality, or even cultural reality, social truths. We can only know these things at one remove. If, if we might have a, a little kitten, we can never know that little kitten in its essential being of catness, of kittenhood. We know that kitten because it has soft fur, uh, because it likes to drink milk, and, or it might make us sneeze. So our perception of the thing is what we know, and it may not be precisely at all points and all times faithful to the reality of the, the kitten. And you extend that in lots of other directions. Well, so this uh, problem of phenomenology, this, this, this problem set of phenomenology, this philosophical concept and a set of problems to work on, has an influence in philosophy and eventually in literature and in cultural studies and also in the hard scientists because in a way it's more or less consistent with 20th century scientific theories such as Einstein's relativity theory and the Heisenberg principle. So that, that gets at all, these all get at the same issue. How do you know that this is actually true? If it's true as far as it goes, is it complete? We know Newtonian physics works for most purposes, but there's a point at which it can't explain some reality that we now know is there. So, in effect, truth changes. And what was always taken to be true is revealed not really to be true. It's no surprise to me, in a way, then, that the same set of ideas would cross over from science to culture, to cultural studies, to philosophy and literature, anthropology and uh, film, art. In the 20th century, and metadrama is, uh, and metadramatic criticism I take to be uh, of a piece with those new scientific understandings and also with the philosophical framework of phenomenology. So back to Othello. First, the play is as much about Iago as it is about Othello. Iago speaks many more lines in the play than Othello does. He's on stage and foregrounded more than, than Othello is himself. But first thing to say is that Iago functions as a surrogate dramatist, as I spoke of a moment ago. 
He's directing the actions. He's manipulating other characters all through the play. Simply in order, well, to achieve his end, I suppose, ostensibly. Ostensibly to achieve his end of getting revenge because he wasn't promoted to lieutenant. Perhaps to get the promotion, after all, but maybe just because it's fun to screw with people. He gets pleasure out of manipulating other people, out of playing with their heads, with messing up, messing them up. So he begins in the very first scene, and we already looked at that last week. He manipulates Rodrigo, and he has been manipulating Rodrigo even before the play, the action of the play begins, taking money from Rodrigo and promising him that he will get access to Desdemona for Rodrigo. So the play opens with Rodrigo angry at Iago because Iago knows that Desdemona has eloped with Othello and Rodrigo is saying, ah, how do you know this? I didn't even know it and you're supposed to be looking out for my interests. And Iago will say, don't worry, we'll take care of it. Her father will never stand for this. Let's go wake him up and we'll, we'll get her back and, and you can have access to her. So we already know that Iago is manipulating or stage directing Rodrigo. He is pulling the strings behind another character, but he also, in that first scene, stages a, a dramatic presentation, really, for Brabantio. So we've got a, a sort of a little play within the play, where he and Rodrigo will be causing a disturbance outside Brabantio's window, waking him up, and interacting with Brabantio, uh, staging a play, really, for Desdemona's father. Well, act one, scene three, then, Brabantio tries to stage a setting, to stage a scene. Brabantio comes to the council where Othello has been summoned in order to lead the military excursion. And Brabantio goes to the Duke and interrupts the proceedings and says, I'm sorry, Duke, uh, please forgive me, Your Excellency, for interrupting, but my daughter, oh, my daughter, something terrible has happened. The Duke says, what is it? Well, she's been stolen. The Duke says, well, whomever has, whoever has stolen your daughter will pay the price. Who was it? And Brabantio says, well, there he is. Othello has done this. Now, he's, he is constructed a scene, a setting, in which he's trying to take control of the action, and he wants Othello to be arrested. He's accusing him, but things spin out of control because unlike Iago, Brabantio doesn't have control of all the characters. When Desdemona is called in, instead of delivering her lines as Brabantio expects her to deliver them, and saying, oh, I must have been beguiled I must have been charmed by uh, Othello. Please forgive me, Father, and take me back. Instead, she says, well, yes, I, I love Othello, and I'm married to him, and I'm sorry, Father, that's the way it is. So it spins out of control, and we have immediately this contrast between Iago's successful stage management, Iago's successful stage management as a kind of a surrogate director, and Brabantio's unsuccessful attempt to do something like the same thing. And at the end of that scene then, only Iago and Rodrigo are left on stage, that's act one, scene three, and Rodrigo is despondent after hearing Desdemona proclaim her love for Othello. Rodrigo talks of suicide, but Iago talks him out of it, but not because he's a nice person and, and wants to prevent someone from committing suicide. He wants to keep Rodrigo alive because he wants to keep getting money from Rodrigo. So Rodrigo keeps saying, oh, I don't know what to do, I'm, I'm in despair. And Iago keeps saying, oh, don't despair, put money in your purse, go get some money. Don't worry, don't be such a sap, uh, don't, don't be so weepy, put money in your purse, again and again. And Rodrigo exits finally, proclaiming, I'll sell all my lands. And Iago concludes that scene and act one by saying to the audience, now here's an example, of the breaking the fourth wall, Iago turns to the audience and says, ha, 
Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. Now you could stage that if you're a director. You could stage that as Iago kind of looking off into the distance and musing to himself as though he's thinking out loud or we're hearing thoughts that he has that he's not saying. But I prefer to see it done where he turns to the audience and says, hey, see what I'm doing? You're in this with me. You're complicit. And I'll just mention that this, <clears throat> in doing this, Shakespeare is also alluding to a standard feature of medieval morality plays. These were plays that preceded Shakespeare's time. They were often plays on moral or religious themes. And sometimes the character would be a demon or a devil. And typically, the demon or the devil would stop to tell the audience what he was doing. I'm leading every man into sin. I'm going to trick every man. I'm going to tempt him. And he's going to succumb to my blandishments and fall into sin because I'm the devil and that's what the devil does. And so the, this vice character, this demon or devil character, is also played for laughs too. Act two, scene three, we see Iago stage managing another character and that's Cassio. Cassio is the lieutenant, the soldier who's been promoted over Iago. Iago happens to know or he happens to have heard that Cassio uh, can't hold his liquor and that he likes to fight when he is drinking. And so he cajoles Cassio into joining the rebels to celebrate the so-called victory over the Turks. Cassio gets drunk and before you know it, he's, he's gotten into a fight with someone. Iago has managed all that to happen. Then when Cassio gets arrested, Iago pretends to be on his side and says, don't worry, I'll get you out of this. Then Acts 3, scene 1, the next scene, Iago offers to help Cassio get to Desdemona. Now, he's also helping Rodrigo get to Desdemona, but he's going to help Cassio get to Desdemona just to get his job back. He's going to encourage Desdemona through his wife, Amelia, to intercede with Othello just to get uh, pardon and reinstatement for Cassio. Although, now he's going to present that whole scenario to Othello, not as just Desdemona's attempt to help Cassio get the job back, but as Desdemona's true sexual attraction for Cassio instead of for Othello. So in Act 3, Scene 3, Desdemona, as a result of Amelia's encouragement and her general goodwill toward Cassio, Desdemona tries to influence Othello on Cassio's behalf saying, you know, he's not a bad guy, give him another chance. Anyone can make a mistake. But after she and Amelia leaves, Iago and Othello are left alone, and Iago begins to insinuate that Desdemona and Cassio are having an affair. Oh, you know, I heard, I saw them whispering, I don't know what that was about. Oh, I don't want to say anything bad about anyone. Never mind, forget I said that. So throughout the play, he's pretending Throughout the play, he's pretending to be everyone's faithful friend, but in fact, as he says um, in Act 1, Scene 1, he, he serves no one but himself. So Desdemona tries to influence him. At the end of Act 3, Scene 3, Iago has influenced Othello against his wife to the point, and we'll watch this in, in a moment, that Othello vows revenge against Desdemona. So Iago has, as a surrogate dramatist, he has directed Othello to this conclusion. And at the end of that act, Othello says, damn her, lewd minx, damn her, damn her. Come, go with me apart. I will withdraw to furnish me with some swift means of death for the fair devil. Now art thou my lieutenant. And Iago says, I am your own forever. Othello probably means not you're my lieutenant, I've given you the promotion, the official promotion, he probably means, you're my aide, you're my helper, thanks for your help in figuring out, helping me to, to understand that my wife is unfaithful with Cassio. So it's a richly complex kind of double meaning. When Othello says, now thou art my lieutenant, 
And Iago responds, I am your own forever. There's a kind of ironic allusion to the promotion that Cassio got and that Iago was passed over for from the beginning of the play. Only now Othello has enlisted the aid of a demon for a lieutenant. He has put himself in league with the devil and he has set himself on an evil mission. Act four begins with a surveillance scene. I mentioned surveillance scene. In a surveillance scene, Iago positions Othello to hide and watch while he engages Cassio in a conversation. He suggests to Othello that he's going to draw Cassio out to make incriminating statements about his relationship with Desdemona. Instead, he positions Othello far enough away that he can't hear exactly what they're talking about. And he goes to Cassio and starts joking around with him about having sex with Bianca, the prostitute, the courtesan. Othello is far enough away that all he sees is Iago and Cassio joking about having sex with a woman. He doesn't know that they're joking about Cassio and Bianca. He thinks they're talking about Cassio and Desdemona. After that, in the next scene, Othello accuses Desdemona of unfaithfulness vaguely. He doesn't get very specific about it, and she, doesn't, she has no idea what he's talking about. There's a metadramatic element to that as well, in so far as the metadramatic criticism is concerned with the problems of communication and interpretation, with really understanding what someone is saying to you when they're saying it and communicating that, of course, on stage. Then, in Act 4, Scene 3, no longer in need of Rodrigo or Cassio, Iago prompts Rodrigo to attempt to murder Cassio. If he gets Cassio out of the way, then Cassio cannot reveal, cannot testify that he was just being innocent with Desdemona and then he was talking about his relationship with Bianca. He would, it's like getting a witness out of the way, right? So he prompts Rodrigo to do that. Of course, Rodrigo's inept, so when he tries to, when Rodrigo tries to kill Cassio, he only injures him, and other people arrive on the scene, and so then Iago pretends to come, be coming to Cassio's rescue, and he stabs and kills Rodrigo getting him out of the way. So he'll be unavailable to testify against Iago. And in Act 5, Scene 2, driven into a, a, a frenzy of rage, of jealousy, Othello kills his wife, Desdemona, under the false assumption that she has been unfaithful to him. Then, at the end of the play, Act 5, Scene 3, Emilia, Iago's wife, and Desdemona's maid comes in and discovers the dying Desdemona and Othello is there, and her, her question is, what have you done, you crazy fool? She said, well, I've, I've, I've uh, saved my honor, I've killed this unfaithful wife. And Amelia realizes what has happened because she's been in the center of it. She stole the handkerchief and gave it to Iago that was used as evidence by Iago to prove to Othello that his wife had been unfaithful. And she unravels the plot, and, and you know, Othello faces death in, in grief, and maybe evoking pity, but looking also rather foolish. So all the way through, then, I, and I'm re repeating some of what I said earlier about the about the uh, uh, plot line, but at several points there, the, the real interesting key, or one of the real interesting keys, is not only how immoral Iago is, how motiveless his malignity is, but also how skillful he is at tricking other characters and deceiving other characters with dramatic and communicative methods. On that note, I'll conclude this webcast. But, as always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email. Thank you.